Zola's Cafe again. Uh huh. Welcome. And <coughs> chapter five, right after chapter four of the Ghetto Sketches. I see. What we're doing today is taking us into the, uh, I should say, the intimate lives of a couple of people named uh, Taco McNeil and her girlfriend. A girlfriend, Slick Rena Dorsey. I don't know what that could possibly be other than something that shouldn't be. But now it's gone. I wonder what it was. A signal of some sort? I guess. The marshes have landed? for you to do your thing. Okay. Okay. Well, they're gone now. As I was saying, <clears throat> the action takes place in the apartment, I should say the pad, of uh, Slick Rena Dorsey and her girlfriend, Tomo Taco McNeil, as most of you uh, uh, remember, these two ladies were shouting out of the window at Father Love, calling him indecent names and <laughs> uh, other th things. And what this gives you is an idea of how it is they spend their day. The chapter heading is called Bogarting, mm. as in, I think it's an out, outdated bit of slang when people used to pass the joint around and somebody would hold on to it and want to take a, a hit more than he, was, he or she was supposed to take. And they would say, Stop Bogarting. Mm. So that's what this is called. Hey! Harry Matthews called from within the apartment. Why don't y'all close that window and quit fucking with that man? He's just trying to do his thing, just like the rest of us. And besides, you letting all this good smoke out. The two women, seeing the logic of the suggestion, closed the windows, slurring out a stream of open-edged cuss words. The apartment is shadowy, sparsely furnished, a portable record player, two beat up sofas, a couple of sprung loose easy chairs, a small coffee table, holding on its top, a dime bag, a gram of neatly diced hash, one pack of bamboo papers, and round the table goes the pipe. To Fred Lee, Harry Matthews, Jake the Fake Willis, and Leo Terry. Slick Rena, crossing the smoke heavy room to get the record player, that just gets to me sometimes, watching that little old jive ass punk rip these old sisters off like that. They say he's got two or three old white uh, wrinkle up uh, rich uh, white bras sticking coins to him too. Where, Leo? I don't know where. Somewhere, that's what they say. Slick Rena changing sides on the box. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. He ought to stick it to all the old wrinkle up white bitches he can reach. They can't afford it. She pauses and turns to the group with one hand planted aggressively on her hip. You know something? I wish some Jenny ass nigga would even dare to try to approach me with some of that bullshit. <laughs> Father love, ain't that some shit? Harry Matthews listening to Slick Rena and keeping an eye on the hash pipe at the same time comes down on Fred Lee. Goddamn Fred Lee, I've been watching your greedy ass. What you gonna do, smock all of it? Be cool, man. You act like you ain't never had them. <coughs> you act like you ain't never had them, Ash. <coughs> no. He reluctantly passes the pipe on the hair. Wrapped it door, coughing a spasm by the past smoke. Harry drags on the pipe. I know some funny thing about you. <coughs> Friendly. <coughs> no matter what goes around. <coughs> That's a pretty nice smoke. Yeah, no matter <coughs> what going around, you always seem to be. Remember, the one who gets the lion's share. Why is that? <coughs> Jake the Fake, slyly observing the scene from an elbow rest position on the sofa. Shit, both of you niggas is hogs. Leo Terry leans over to slap Jake's palm in agreement. Right on, bro, right on. The pipe is refilled and passed. Lady Day, Miss Flat, Brother Hathaway, and Coltrane, both Alice and John, are played, turned over and played again. 
Taco, renowned for her delicate touch, rolls four more joints and passes them around behind the pipe. My old glass. Oh. My old glass. <laughs> Eyeballs redden, lids weigh themselves down, the talk becomes contagious. Harry, with a win to those in the know, signifies to Leo, Hey man, when was the last time you seen your old running buddy, old Gimps? Leo holding marijuana smoking, man, <laughs> almost loses it, answering the question, sucks it back down quickly. Man, <coughs> don't talk to me about that lame ass motherfucker. <laughs> the last time me and that fool got together, he got me put in jail. What happened, Leo? Leo takes a couple of quick hits on the last half inch of his joint, settled back. He stumbled up in my face one day, telling me he had just put in a day pearl diving at some restaurant on the north side. And that the white boy who owned the place kept grand theft dough in a cracker box in the rear of the joint. See him? There go Fred Lee again, Bogart and the smokes. Be quiet, Harry. Shit, go ahead, Leo. Leo looks indulgently at Fred Lee and continues. Well, anyway, I was suspicious of the old bastard, you know? I mean, he's one of them natural bone liars, just like somebody else we know. But I was going through one of those deep money slumps Money was out to lunch. So I decided to go on and try to pull off a little sting with the old asshole. He had made it sound so easy, I couldn't resist. All you got to do, Leo, he says to me, is climb up over some shit in the back of the joint, rip off, and walk out the front door if you want to. You did. It was going to be that clean. All right. Sound mellow to me. So... I runs onto the pad, puts my work clothes on, and goes over to Gimpy's place to get the complete lowdown of the thing before we're supposed to get there by, I don't know, 12, 30 at night. There's a sudden screeching noise from the streets, the sound of someone's car brakes being suddenly applied, all heads turn quickly toward the sound of arenas. She takes a hard hit on the joint and mumbles, kill him, he ain't no kidding to me. <laughs> You sure is cold, Rena. Jake tells her with just a tone of admiration in his voice. Gotta be sweet thing. Life is a cold-blooded game. Leo catches the last half inch of another joint, making the round and goes on. All right. Me and Gimps sit around, him giving me the full rundown on the setup till, uh, I don't know, 11 or so drinking wine and smoking some of the baddest weed I smoked in a long time. I really didn't know how bad the shit was till we got on the bus heading north. Yeah, Jake, the fucking bus. That's how he was. <laughs> I'm listening with all this and this old motherfucker run this bullshit down on me telling me how much pussy I'd be able to buy and shit. But all of a sudden I look up around us and discover we the only niggas on the bus. Well, the motherfucker had told me that said, out north, I just thought, you know, he meant north. I don't know where my head was behind that jive wine and that bad gunny. We had got so far off in one of them snow lily white neighborhoods, I was scared that me might get busted for riding to the front of the bus. But, well, anyway, it's too late now, and besides, I'm feeling kind of white myself. What with all that plucking weed in my system? He pauses to take a grateful hit on the joint, making the current round. We must have really been unnoticed. Just about as unnoticed as death strolling downtown, munching on a dry soda cracker. Gimpy with his black ass hat on a white beaver hat. But, a white beaver hat? The brim tearing down all around, he's scuttling along like a fucking crab. Got nerve, if you can believe it, to be trying to high step off of that light green. The people in the room breaking the laughter, contagious marijuana hash laughter, sustained, rib tickling laughter. Man, 
I don't know who we thought it was. Gimpy was fucked up looking with his hat and shit, but I was just as bad. I had a new pair of stasis, yellow as canaries. And since I had my hair comped in them days, I had my do-rag around my skull. And we were supposed to be going to do a job looking uh, uh, inconspicuous. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. But I don't think it was working out too damn well. I didn't really notice at the time, but I guess every hunk in the neighborhood must have called the police as soon as they saw us walking down the street. Taco stares at Leo frowning. You say you had a do-rag on. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I had my do-rag on. Mm -hmm. I hadn't got black and proud yet. Number one, I was too poor to be proud, and if somebody had called me black, I would have been insulted. Mm -hmm. A knock on the door freezes everyone, stifles beginning laughter. They look at each other paranoidly. The two women drop the dope on the table down into their panties. The men snuff out the roaches and curl them into their onion palms. Quickly, Rena steps to the door, leans her ear against it for a moment before asking, Yeah, who is it? After a long pause, tightening everybody in the room up a little bit, a tired voice answered, It's me, baby. Me, baby June. <laughs> the group relaxes and immediately slip back off into the groove. Rena opens the door full six inches worth. What you want, Jim? Baby June, his quick ferret eyes darting over her head, his nostrils sniffing angrily, hangrily, hungrily. I'll get that right in a minute. <laughs> hungrily at the dope fumes. All right, dig, slick. Me and bro, bam. Then cop the half box load of pants suits and, and we... I uh, want to see if uh, <laughs> if y'all wanted uh, to, if you and Taco wanted uh, some Fred Lee calls out from across the room yeah hey June why don't y'all come on back through here in a couple of hours from now I'm expecting some change to be laid on me in a little while as soon as my woman gets home we might be able to do each other some good then yeah June Rena adds firmly slowly closing the door Come on back in a couple of hours. Yeah, all right, Miss Lady. June says, a hurt look in his eyes. I'll catch y'all later on. Mm -hmm. Shit, you can never tell. Hey, wait a minute. You really think he's got something nice? She asked Fred Lee. Shit, you can't never tell about Batman. June, I bought some boss things from him from time to time. He holds up. Uh, his wrist. Can you dig this genuine Swiss movement timepiece? Hmm. Yeah, if they say they got something, it's nine times out of ten, they got something. Either that, or they'll run out and beat somebody for it. <laughs> <laughs> Taco turns her back to the men modestly, goes down to her panties to retrieve the hidden dope. Go ahead, she tells Leo. Go ahead and finish your story. I know y'all want. I know y'all went through some changes. Rena heads for the toilet with a mischievous smile on her face. Hold on a minute. Let me go clean this pack off. Taco cracks up, understanding immediately what the deal is. The men look at each other, puzzled for a minute, before the full realization comes down. Fred Lee wrinkles his nostrils up subconsciously. Oh, goddamn, Rena. You mean to tell me? The men sit looking vaguely disgusted. As Taco is taken by a little giggle spasm from time to time. <laughs> Rena. <laughs> Rena returns to the sea, straightening her skirt and wiping the glassine baggie off with a bit of toilet paper. Didn't get too wet. <laughs> you sure is cold, baby. Jake smiles at her in spite of the situation. You sure is cold. Rena tosses the bag back on the table and tells him, don't worry about it, it's still smokable. Taco begins to clean and roll a couple more joints. The atmosphere of the crib slips into a mellower groove, having been touched by a threat, a danger that really wasn't a danger at all. Hail, baby June. All right, Leo, what the fuck happened? Like I said, we're in this dilly white neighborhood. 
Then got around in the alley to the rear of the place. I'm climbing up through the window, high as a motherfucker. Gimpy hadn't told me about the motherfucking window. It's almost two stories off the ground. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I clams in, locates the cracker box right where he said it would be. Skim a nice little taste off the top. And then I pull Gimps up and we split the rest on the spot. Come to about three bills a piece. Excuse me, my extra taste. All right, we're getting away clean, dig it? But no, no, no. Gimpy, with his crazy ass, got to stop and brew some coffee. <laughs> the room suddenly suspends its motion. The joints pause and mid tote Mild will turn into cynical angles and a cause of disbelief sputters out from all present. Bullshit! You got to be jiving. Oh, shit. Come on, man. Show is cold, brother. Show is cold. Leo gestures urgently, trying to convince everyone of the truth of the thing. I swear for God. If I'm lying, I hope God will strike me dead. Gents had dug the cat who owned the place making this uh, espresso shit. And he had a couple of cups back in the kitchen between trays. So I guess he figures out now was a good time for him to have a full cup out front. Or something. I'll never know what was on the brother's mind. Because Lord knows I wasn't in the right frame of mind myself. Anyway, you dig, I'm telling him, hey man, pick up a couple of bags of this shit and take it on home and make it. And he's telling me, I ain't got no espresso machine to do it with. And I'm telling him, nigga, you got 300 motherfucking dollars. Buy your own, buy yourself one. And there we are arguing and carrying on both of us loaded back. Truth be told, loaded back. Next thing I knew, the damn joint is surrounded by 50 squad cars, three helicopters, eight Hollywood spotlights, and half the motherfucking neighborhood. You would have thought they was coming in after Dillinger or somebody. Well, <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, by the time the pig came in on us, I had tried my goddamn to beat Bentley Gimpy's ass to death. Police thought it was really funny. Two niggas fighting over some bags of coffee on their way back to the Black Mariah. I ain't seen Gimp since then. That was about five years ago. And quiet as it's kept, I don't want to see him either. <laughs> Jake leans over to drop a palm onto Leo's outstretched hand. Yeah, I can dig it, man. I can really dig it. <laughs> we all got caught up in them binds, brother, believe me. I got busted on a hummer or something like that my first day in. Excuse me, Taco. Fred Lee pops in politely. Hey, Rena, what you got to snack on, baby? I could really dig some sweets for about now. You know, some little takes this taste out of my mouth. Harry, for the first time, reaffirms a feeling with Fred Lee. Hey, that sure is a good idea. I could do something sweet myself. Rena goes into the small kitchen section, makes jelly sandwiches, weaves back into the main room with a plate full. How about it? Can y'all do some jelly bread sandwiches? The apartment, one of those hip, dope, comatose stages by now, flutters with feelings, both honest and slick, full of implication. Watch Fred Lee! Harry, Ma Harry Matthews called out, He'll spoon out the whole jar if you don't watch him. Fred Lee snatching up a grape cellar jelly sandwich. Fuck you on your nose, motherfucker. All of the people in the room munch on jelly, slammed on bread, momentarily meditate as their jaws gently crunch air-filled white bread and too sweet jam, ruminating. Taco munching on her sandwich, looks over at Rena and starts giggling. All right, all right, to, oh, okay, Taco, don't start that shit. Let, let me tell you about what happened to us yesterday. Girl, don't you mention that. Oh, Rena, shit, let me tell them about it. It was funny as hell. <laughs> me and Rena was in the supermarket buying something for a change. Jake the Fake responds to the idea with mock humor. I don't believe it. You were actually buying something? <laughs> Taco puffs her nose into there 
and announces in a dry, cool voice, Yes, Jerry, we were shopping. Just a couple of plain, ordinary shopping uh, people. Well, we had stuck a few packs of bologna away in different places, but most of the stuff was in the cart. Anyway, how did you manage to wind up with, we made a bet, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We made a bet, me and Rena, that she couldn't get out of the store with a big item. <laughs> she puffed her chest out to me. Y'all must have been loaded, huh? Taco circles so natural with a quick defensive touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were. Puffs her bosom out full force. You know something? I bet I could walk out of here with anything I wanted, she said to me. Bet you can't. I said to her, you know, like a challenge, but not really meaning for it to be a challenge. Rena, puffing quietly on a joint, smiles and shines it on. Shit, she said, I could walk out of this fucking store with half a shelf full of this jazz if I want to go here. Pick something. Pick something. Go ahead. Pick something for me. She takes me. So, <laughs> yeah. I picked one of those Polish hams, you know, the five-pound ones in the can, the big the hams they got. Oh, wow. Yeah, baby, a five-pound canned Polish ham. What was the bet? Leo asked, talking up. What do we bet, a pack of cigarettes? Rena asked, her eyes telling everyone she remembered what the bet was. A pack? Hell, we bet a carton. Rena smacks... <coughs> Tacos out that palm and reaffirmation of the truth. Right on, a carton, that's right, a carton. This this chick takes the ham, this five pound canned ham, goes to the end of the aisle, hold on, hold on, and wedges up between her legs and walks back past me just as cool as you please. I'm looking at her and thinking, if this bitch get out of here with a hand between her thighs, I'm going to pay her double. I'm not jiving. I felt a little bit shaky, but everything is cool. We stand in this checkout line, chit-chatting, you dig? Just two little nilly-dilly housewives doing their weekly shopping. Gets up to the checkout girl. By this time, I'm about to bust out laughing, and the security guard strolls by and gives us the eye. We thought he was checking us out at first, but no, no, no. Taco continues, that wasn't it. The nigga was getting flirty. <laughs> Not only that, this checkout girl has to call one of the managers over. That's the price for something we had. And the next thing I know, with the manager on one side of us and this Uncle Tom guard on the other side, I hear a loud clunk. <laughs> the man behind us looked down between Rena's legs and said something like, uh, Lady, you dropped your hair. <laughs> the damn thing almost broke my ankle. Ah, oh, but you played it off really beautiful. She bends over, oh so ladylike, and says, uh, Why, well, thank you, sir, thank you very much. And places it up on the counter with the rest of the stuff like it had just been pushed off or something. And then we staggered our path to God laughing our asses off. I'm still waiting for my carton of cigarettes. If I recall correctly, we had to pay for that damn ham which makes it a complete different thing altogether. A hell of a lot different from Booster. <laughs> Fred Lee, his eyes darting from one face to another, opens his mouth on the calm. Y'all really something else. I'm telling you the truth. Really something else. <coughs> we just smoke all the hash. No, we didn't smoke it all. Harry answered on the way to the toilet. We got something left. Go ahead. Fire it up. This will be the last time I go on anything with you, with your greedy ass. Fuck you in your armpit, motherfucker. <laughs> Fred Lee calls out after a minute and a half serious matter. A gentle tapping on the door cools everyone out. Damn, I, I, I bit this spam in baby June. I ain't even been on to check my trap yet. Reno's whispers loudly on the way to the door. Did you see the look on Baby June's face when I opened the door and he sniffed all that good hash smoke? Yeah! <laughs> it, it wouldn't have done him any good anyway, not even if he had given him a hit. I don't think he and Bam can get half and smoke anymore. 
Probably not. Not behind Mr. Jones. Yeah. Who is it? Me, baby. Rita opens the door, pinched before realizing her mistake. Two black detectives in stylish dress blast through the door, followed by the superior, a white boy. Fred Lee, Taco Leo, and Jake the Fake, their states of mind immediately and intensely altered by the abrupt intrusion, scramble for the back door to be confronted by more policemen. Mm -hmm. The group is rounded up in the living room. Jackson, you and Rogers go over to this place with a fine-toothed comb. They probably got narcotics stashed all over the damn joint. The two black detectives go about their work with a will, throwing sofa pillows on the floor, pulling things apart. Uh, officer, have you got a search warrant? Jake asked the white boy. Move it, Jake, he snarls at him. We don't need one to get the goods on you. Harry nonchalantly strolls out of the john, buttoning his fly. Realizing what the deal is, he casually turns to re-enter the toilet as though it were the most natural thing in the world to do. Officer Jackson pulls him back out of the neck, out by the neck. One more to go. A few curious people stand around in front of the building, watching the group being led out with sullen, hostile faces. Big Mama stands up, both hands braced on her ropey waistline, to better check out the happenings. Bam and Baby June, lurking amongst the faces in the small crowd, signal to the group being led away that they didn't bring the goods. Fred Lee holds his cuffed wrists up and shrugs in a disgusted manner. Big Mama reseats herself as the squad cars roll past, whips her snuff from side to side and her bottom lip, and spits out a hard, heavy stream of brown juice. Evening time, streets crowded, folks returning from the plantations back to the reservation. A Bantu stand that is politely not called that. Ghetto is more acceptable. Kids playing, unmindful of anything and everything but play. Rudy and a small group stand on the corner after having sold their strength again today, rapping. Bessie made black. Neither young nor old, a bit stocky in shape, dark skin and wearing a natural hairstyle that is more the result of hard work and sweat than design, trudges unsteadily up the street, carrying a shopping bag in each hand. She pauses on the fringe of a small group of men gathered on the corner, resting her bags and casually listening to Rudy, Quindy, and others. Okay, Quindy. <coughs> you say we got... 22 million black people in the United States, huh? I say we got twice that many, maybe three times that many, if you could count all of the one fifteenths and whatnot we got running around. Quindy Jones shaking his head in a very irritated manner. Probably so, probably so, more than likely, but all of them ain't committed to revolution. And what we got to have is black folks who ain't afraid of revolution. What revolution? What goddamn revolution? Niggas buying more black and beautiful hairspray and forgetting they got minds? Niggas wearing dachikis? Really supposed to be called danchikis? And trying to figure out what the next brother political philosopher is by, uh, by, by how long his chin whistles is? Niggas going to see Javis movies made by Whitey to tell them how to act? That ain't no revolution. Now can tell us what a revolution was. No, brother. What you, what, what you talking about is on the outside, the face thing. You don't go into no revolution let your enemy have a script of what you plan to do next. Quindy cuts off Rudy's speech-making abruptly. All right, all right. You're always talking theory. Now get down to something practical. You do agree to that, don't you? You motherfucking right by any and all means necessary. But first of all, we're going to have to get rid of a lot of this superficial bullshit we got going on. I ain't saying don't be us, because we probably the groupiest thing going on in this Cold, foul, jive ass country. Ojin Kasi, his lips pursed, pursed in disgust, leans close to Rudy. Brother, there you go again, talking out of both sides of your mouth.
No, OG and Kasi. No, I'm not. Let me finish. I'm saying this. I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. In order to change this shit by any means necessary, mm -hmm. what we're going to have to do is take care of maximum business mm -hmm. and learn how to stop talking so goddamn much mm -hmm. and paying less attention to all these rituals we got going on. Do you know I stood up on the corner shaking hands with a dude for five minutes the other day? <laughs> five minutes. We shook hands upside down, inside out, from the side to the side, I know from Wales, and that same dude would break into my crib and rip every damn thing off the first chance he got, or else he stabbed me in the back if he thought I could even get away with it. Man, damn all this rambling, get to the point. Hey, brother, <laughs> hey, I ain't rambling. I know exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying three things. I'm saying the wall the revolution has to take place, number one, in us. Yeah, us. When we stop beating and killing each other, rapping some jazz about brotherhood, or saying white it made us do it. Number two, the revolution has got to be a battle between the haves and the have-nots. And I ain't talking about his story or how the shit got that way. I'm talking about how much stronger our thing would be if we pulled in all those third world brothers and sisters. And as many of those poor ass crackers as possible. The ones who got their heads straightened out. Get to the point, brother, and stop BSing around. I'm trying to if you shut your goddamn mouth. Who you telling? Shut up. You motherfucker, that's who. Quindy and Rudy Squall baited by agitating wild around him. That's the trouble with you niggas? Bessie made black yells out above the hubbub. That's the trouble. Y'all went ready to kick each other in the ass. <laughs> or else talk to each other to death. But you ain't never willing to listen to each other. Something in the strength and tone of Bessie's voice pulls heads her way. A couple of people comment behind the hands about the slurred texture of her word. Bitch sound like she jumped to me, did mm -hmm. I don't know about what the damn argument was all about. But if it's like the rest of that black, black, black bullshit, I hear past this court every evening, I'll be willing to bet anyone that he could go his way, he could go his way, and both of y'all will wind up in the same race. What difference do it make how each one of y'all get there? But what you wearing and all that, as long as you get, mm -hmm. one damn thing is damn certain. You sure the hell ain't gonna get nowhere fighting each other. Right on, sister. Bubbles from the throat of someone in the crowd. Speak to her, mama. Bessie helped in her bags. You suck her all black, man. Give me a pain in my ass. Mm -hmm. Why didn't send y'all all over the goddamn world I'm fighting for her? Bring it home, stick it back down in the ghetto, and all you can do is all you can think about is just fighting each other. Bessie's church is slowly away from the group, muttering, "Black man, <laughs> shit! I bet both of you niggas got some little white chick off somewhere." Rudy, glancing around, self-consciously calls out to Bessie, "Who you make love to ain't got nothing to do with your our struggle." Mm -hmm. Bessie stops and drops both bags to the pavement, turns to face Rudy with both eyes gleaming. It ain't, huh? Huh? Oh, wait, God damn it! if that's the case then, why don't you fools stop woofing at each other and get on out there and struggle? I think you're full of shit. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. She picks her bags up and continues up the street, the weight of each bag forcing her into a wobbly rolling walk. Mm -hmm. The small group quietly melts away leaving Quindy Jones and Rapping Rudy facing each other. They stand looking sternly at each other for a minute and then burst into spontaneous smiles. Yes. Yes. Quindy wipes a mock sweat from his forehead, tosses the imaginary droplets on the, on the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like sister just ripped a new hole in my bones. Right on. Rudy replies and lays double slaps on Rudy's palms to reaffirm it. So she has some nice points. Yeah, she's on a job. 
But then Betsy always has been outspoken. Even if it was out of pocket, she still said, I can dig it. Look here, Rudy, I got to get on. Give me a ring later on. I got something I want to lay on you. Okay, cool. How you and the birthday doing? Couldn't be sweeter. This couldn't be sweeter. They shake Afro power now. <laughs> All those handshakes. And split. <laughs> Afro power now. Yes. Bessie Mae Black reaches the bottom step of the entrance to her apart the tenement apartment building. Big Mama sits in her day-long position on the porch at the top of the cracked stone steps. Other tenants of the building, trying to cop a stray breeze from anywhere, lounge about the steps sipping warmish brews and fanning themselves with faded newspapers. Bessie exchanges casual nods with the people and waves to Big Mama. Big Mama double checks the bulk of the bags. Goodness gracious, Bessie May. I bet you didn't leave them folks nothing. Bessie leans over into Big Mama's face. She recalls slightly from the alcohol <laughs> on Bessie's breath. Okay. You're right, Big Mama. Almost. I walk way with, I walk away with about much as I can steal and drink. Mm-hmm. Big Mama folds her heavy arms across her mountainous breast and chuckles. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, Bessie May Black. Go ahead with your bear. Still funny. Several people lower down on the steps look up to check out the bullion happenings. They might, they may not pay me a damn thing, but you can bet a fat man I ain't gonna starve because of it. Bessie grabs her bags up again and starts to struggle upstairs. Mm-hmm. Big Mama grabs her arm as she goes by, holds on firmly. Uh, what you got in those bags, daughter? Mm-hmm. They check each other out like major league conspirators. You want to see? You want to see what I got? Mm-hmm. Bessie sets the bags down again and bends down into one. Number one, mm-hmm. I got some chicken pot pies. Mm-hmm. You know how much Fred Lee likes chicken pot pies. Bessie, Big Mama attempts to interrupt. I, I got something. Oh, shit. I just remember my refrigerator ain't working. Would you keep these in your box, Big Mama? Mm-hmm. You can have one. And here I got a quart bottle of what looks like water. But she leans close and whispers drunkenly into Big Mama's ear. It ain't. It's some of that fancy English den. Ooh. English gin? Mm. Dora, I don't see how in the world you managed to walk out with all this stuff. They got so much stuff they don't even know it's gone. And right here I have some uh Big Mama, you know what P A T E is? P A T E. Big Mama pulls the spectacles out of her apron. Pocket squints over the rims at the two can. <laughs> P A T E. Huh? I'll be damned if I know. Oh, oh, oh no. yes, ma'am. I do know what this stuff is. I remember seeing it on the pantry shelf in an old rich woman's house I used to watch for down home. It's some of that cat food rich white folks puts on their crackers and whatnot <laughs> at parties and stuff. <laughs> Daughter, you show these the colored folks you working for? Mm-hmm. Bessie takes a quick sip of the gin. Mm-hmm. Turns back to Big Mama with a grimace. Might be hard to tell what the lady of the house is, but the man is sure enough black. He's a black man. If color has anything to do with it. Hmm. You know what I say? Mm-hmm. Colored folks show sure, these some strange stuff these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> down here in the bottom of this one, I got three silk shirts for Freddie. Sit down for a minute, daughter. That's what I've been trying to talk to you about since you walked up. Huh? Big Mama looks sadly up the street at a group of children playing tag, darting in and out of the street from between parked cars. Fred Lee's in jail, baby. In jail for what? Well... I don't rightly know for what, but I saw the police pulling him, Leo, Jake Willis, Harry Matthews, and them out of that uh, out of Taco and Slick Renner's place this afternoon. Mm. T 
tears slide down Bessie's cheeks. I told that fool to stay away from them thugs. If I told him once, I must have told him a thousand times. Stay away from them thug ass niggas. They don't mean you no good. Mm -hmm. No good at all. They do is steal and lie and cheat. But no, he wouldn't listen to me. He just wouldn't listen. Big Mama pulls a small packet of Kleenex out of her pocket, silently hands it to Bessie, a deep, compassionate look on her face. Bessie dabs at the tears, wipes her eyes. Big Mama, would you keep this stuff for me? I guess I better roll down to the station and see what I can do. Don't be too hard on them, daughter. Not being able to find a job and all after coming back from that Vietnamese war with everything. Couldn't have done too much for the boy's morale. You go ahead on and do what you can do. I'll keep this stuff till you get back. Uh, you, you better let me have that fire water too. You don't make no sense getting all fuzzy minded going down there talking to those people. Wait, before you take that in, let me have a little shot. I need something for my nerves. Mm -hmm. Well, come on into the house. I'll give you a glass. The two women lug a shopping bag of piece into Big Mama's first floor apartment. Mrs. Hattie Daniels leans out of a second floor window, scans the block quickly. Any of y'all seen Philistine? She calls downstairs. One of the women looks up to Miss Evans, points to the end of the block. I saw her turn the corner a little while ago with True Man. The muscle in Miss Evans' jaw lump up as she turns from the window, shaking her head. I didn't told that girl. On the third floor, directly across the street from Miss Rabbit's apartment, apartment 300, Lou Bertha Franklin, a well-developed 18-year-old girl, sister woman with a beautifully shaped mushroom afro, sits on the edge of her bed by the window in her cramped bedroom, looking down onto the street and writing on the uneven bottom surface of a straight-back kitchen chair. Roberta's eyes swim up and down the street, take her in the sight of lazy scraps of paper gently drifting along on the early evening breezes, the stacked piles of garbage at the curb on both sides of the street, waiting since week before last to be picked up. People moving along in a slow stream, coming home to their section of the layered cake. Old dudes sit across from each other, check the board, brace on their knees, making a move from time to time, oblivious to everything else but their game. Bam and Baby June on the nod, on the prowl, on the nod, on the prowl, on the prowl, a vicious cycle. Two white men in uniform with badges on their chests in a squad car slowly wheel through the neighborhood looking cold, mean, merciless, white. They ease up past the Afro Lord sitting on the front steps of Lena Daniels' apartment building, rapping. Roberta's eyes missed over a bit, watching Bessie Mae Black stagger up out of Big Mama's apartment and up the street. <laughs> what the hell did it cry about? She asks herself aloud, surprised to hear the sound of her voice above the other sounds spilling into her open window. Roberta places her pencil carefully on the chair bottom beside her paper and starts to wipe the beginning tears from her eyes. But while her hands are there, she pauses to sniff at the odors coming from the food being cooked in her mother's kitchen. The sudden rank smell of burnt bean from another window in the building. The sudden shifting of a breeze brings another smile and then another one, almost too many for her nostrils to deal with, and then subtly, as she removes her hands from her eyes, leaving them closed, noises swirl around her ears, replacing the smells. The music of every description forcing a framework for every sound, the quick laughter from something, a baby crying, the rumbling, screechy grind of a nearby elevator train, the impatient yelling of Mrs. Evans for her daughter, Philistine, and from below her, on the second floor of the savage town, the two people fighting, the clear, furious sound of things being thrown, broken, the rotten curses screamed out. A large piece of something being thrown, jars, the Bertha's eyes open, a piece of whatever it seemed to be so close that she involuntarily flinches back. Her eyes open instantly, draw themselves to the wall opposite her bed, to a hole sealed by the tin top of a can. The tin seal bulges 
buckles as though pressure is being applied from the other side. Luberta stares at the tin buckling, fascinated, but realizing exactly who and what is causing the round piece of tin nailed into the rotted wood to give way more and more with each inner push. She quietly curls her legs up under her and waits, her eyes slowly going from the open window where the twilight casts shadows on her walls to the hole. The tin seals, seals, falls away from the hole with a light metallic clatter and seconds later, a slender gray head pulls a large quivering body through the hole. Luberta's breath comes in short, frightened bursts as she studies the rat's body. The gray hair missing from his neck, his back, singed away by some long ago accident, revealing gnarled pink skin. The rat moves along the baseboard a few inches at a time in quick darting motions. He turns slowly to face Luberta his tail twitching against the wall as though he had known she was there all the time, hmm. but had decided not to pay her any attention unless absolutely necessary. His brother slips out through the hole in one swift motion, a larger, healthier version. The two rats making small, nervous movements keep their beady eyes trained on the Bertha as they sniffle along an inch at a time. The Bertha moves her eyes around wildly for something to throw at them. Only her shoes are in reach but on the floor, and the thought of reaching down to where the rat's fangs are almost turns her stomach. Finally, having cast around for whatever might be throwable and finding nothing, she frantically slaps her hands together and makes a swoosh sound. The rats give her an instant look and waddle back into their hole. The one with the hair missing turns to look out at her from the darkness of the hole, his small round eyes burning. Luberta claps her hands again, and the eyes disappear. She sits, tightened up, breathing hard, feels her hard, and smiles at the thought of how scared she felt. Jumps off of her bed, vengefully, and takes her shoe heel to hammer the covering back on the hole. Returns to the bed slightly out of breath and leans back wistfully against the wall, casually looking at two silhouetted figures on Miss Rabbit's rooftop across the street, passing a slow burning joint back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Charlotte Franklin, a middle-aged version of her daughter, leans against the doorway to her bored daughter's room, arms folded, looking at her affectionately. Roberta, why don't you turn on some light? You're going to be blind as a bat trying to read and write in the dark. Or are you just sitting here mooning about that young man? What's his name? Mm. Luberta turns from the open window to study her mother's face in the fading light. Whose name? She asks, bringing herself all the way back. Your young man, the one with the funny name. Oh, Quindy. <laughs> mm. I wasn't thinking about him. I was thinking about a bit of mousetrap. Mrs. Franklin wrinkles her brow, a familiar expression with her of parental indulgence. Mm -hmm. She steps into the room to glance at the sheets of paper on Luberta's chair desk. What are you writing? A poem. A poem. My God, I thought you were writing a new declaration of independence or something. Mm -hmm. Long as you've been at it. Who knows? Might be someday. We could sure as hell new, use a brand new one. Mm -hmm. You want to hear it? Mm -hmm. uh, honey, I'd like to, but your daddy be home in five minutes, hungry as a bear, and if I don't have it on the table, you know how he is. Uh, why don't you read it to me lay down? Mrs. Franklin bustled the ways to the kitchen as Lou Bertha stares absentmindedly at the cupboard hole on the other side of the room and then back onto the darkening street. Mm -hmm. End of chapter five oh. of... The ghetto sketches. Life goes on, kids. People it get goes involved. on and on, mm -hmm. and as you can see and as you can tell, mm -hmm. nothing is ever just one dimensional. Poor it has guy. a lot of dimensions, and that's the way it's going. We'll start on chapter six tomorrow, mm -hmm. which is about a very interesting thing. I think <laughs> the title of the chapter is called "The Pink Lady Himself," and it deals with uh, a gay man named Mayflower. Um, and that's all I'm going to say at this point right. because now it's time for me to
Move on up <laughs> to other things. Go for it. All right. Thank See you, you back here. Cafe Zola tomorrow. Same Looking time, forward same to it. Thank you, Odie Hawkins. Website www.odiehawkins.com. Com. And the ghetto sketches is presently out of print. It can be purchased on Amazon for $75, but you might want to hold off because we're considering reissuing it in 2019. Thank you. Bye. I had to finish this chapter.